I'm Helen LaCrane and I'm going to be reading to you today from the complete works of Saki. Saki being the, uh, the pen name of H. H. Monroe, Hector Hugh Monroe, who was a British author who wrote uh, in the early part of the 20th century, just prior to and, and into World War I. Um, he is known for the excellence of his short stories, uh, although he also wrote uh, some novels and uh, plays. Now, Saki was, was well known for poking fun at the aristocracy, but also, uh, also at those people who aspired to join the aristocracy. Theodoric Volker had been brought up from infancy to the confines of middle age by a fond mother whose chief solicitude had been to keep him screened from what she called the coarser realities of life. When she died, she left Theodoric alone in a world that, that was as real as ever and a good deal coarser than he considered it had any need to be. To a man of his temperament and upbringing, even a simple railway journey was crammed with petty annoyances and minor discords, and as he settled himself down in the second-class compartment one September morning, he was conscious of ruffled feelings and general mental discomposure. He had been staying at a, a country vicarage, the inmates of which had been certainly neither brutal nor bacchanalian but <laughs> their supervision of the domestic establishment had been of that lax order which invites disaster. The pony carriage that was to take him to the station had never been properly ordered, and when the moment for his departure drew near, the handyman, who should have produced the required article, was nowhere to be found. In this emergency, Theodoric, to his mute but very intense disgust, found himself obliged to collaborate with the vicar's daughter in the task of harnessing the pony, which necessitated groping about in an ill-lighted outhouse called a stable and smelling very like one, except in patches where it smelt of mice. Without being actually afraid of mice, Theodoric classed them among the coarser incidents of life and considered that Providence, with a little exercise of moral courage, might have long ago have recognized that they were not indispensable and have withdrawn them from circulation. As the train glided out of the station, Theodoric's nervous imagination accused himself of exhaling a weak odor of stable yard and possibly of displaying a moldy straw or two on his usually well-brushed garments. Fortunately, the only other occupant of the compartment, a, a lady of about the same age as himself, seemed inclined for slumber rather than scrutiny. The train was not due to stop till the terminus was reached in about an hour's time, and, and the carriage was of the old-fashioned sort that held no communication with the corridor. Therefore, no further travelling companions were likely to intrude on Theodoric's semi-privacy. And yet, the train had scarcely attained its normal speed before he became reluctantly but, but vividly aware that he was not alone with the slumbering lady. He was not even alone in his own clothes. A warm, creeping movement over his flesh betrayed the unwelcome and highly resented presence, unseen but poignant, of a strayed mouse that had evidently dashed into its present retreat during the episode of the pony harnessing. Furtive 
stamps and shakes and wildly directed pinches failed to dislodge the intruder, whose motto indeed seemed to be Excelsior. And the lawful compartment of the clothes lay back against the cushions and endeavored rapidly to evolve some means for putting an end to the dual ownership. It was unthinkable that he should con continue for the space of a whole hour and in the horrible position of a hostel for vagrant mice. Indeed, his imagination had at least doubled the number of the alien invasion. On the other hand, nothing less drastic than partial disrobing would ease him of his tormentor. And to undress in the presence of a lady, even for so laudable a purpose, was an idea that made his ear tips tingle in a lord of, in a blush of, of abject shame. He had never been able to bring himself even to the mild exposure of open work socks in the presence of the fair sex. And yet the, the lady in this case was to all appearances soundly and securely asleep. The mouse, on the other hand, seemed to be trying to crowd a, a wanderjahr into a few strenuous minutes. If there is any truth in the theory of transmigration, this particular mouse must certainly have been, in a, in a former state, a member of the Alpine Club. Sometimes, in its eagerness, it, it lost its footing and slipped for half an inch or so, and then, in fright or more, probably temper, it bit. Theodoric was goaded into the, the most audacious undertaking of his life, crimsoning to the hue of a beet, beetroot and, and, and keeping an agonized watch on his slumbering fellow traveler. He swiftly and noiselessly secured the ends of his railway rug to the racks on either side of the carriage so that a substantial curtain hung athwart the compartment. In the narrow dressing room that he had thus improvised, he proceeded with violent haste to extricate himself partially and the mouse entirely from the surrounding casings of tweed and half wool. As the unraveled mouse gave a wild leap to the floor, the rug, slipping its fastenings at either end, also came down with a heart-curdling flop and almost simultaneously, the awakened sleeper opened her eyes. With a movement almost quicker than the mouse's, Theodoric pounced on the rug and hauled its ample folds chin high over his dismantled person as he collapsed into the further corner of the carriage. The blood raced and beat in the veins of his neck and forehead while he waited dumbly for the communication cord to be pulled. The lady, however, contented herself with a, a silent stare at her strangely muffled companion. How much had she seen? Theodoric queried to himself, and, and in any case, what, what on earth must she think of his present posture? I mean, I, th I think... I have caught a chill, he ventured desperately. Really? Well, I'm sorry, she replied. I was just going to ask if you would open this window. I, 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 I fancy it's malaria, he added, his teeth chattering slightly, as much from fright as from a desire to support his theory. I've got some brandy in my hold all, if you'll kindly reach it down for me, said his companion. No, not not for the world. I, uh, I mean, I, <laughs> I never take anything for it, he assured her earnestly. I suppose you caught it in the tropics. Theodoric, whose acquaintance with the tropics was limited to the annual present of a chest of tea from an uncle in Salon, felt that even the malaria was slipping from him. Would it be possible, he wondered, to, to disclose the real state of affairs to her in, in small installments? Oh, 
<clears throat> Are you a a afraid of mice? He ventured, growing, if possible, more scarlet in the face. Not unless they come in quantities, like those that ate up Bishop Hatto. <laughs> Why do you ask? I, ha I had what crawling inside my clothes just now, said Theodoric, in a voice that hardly seemed his own. It was a, a most awkward situation. Well, it must have been if you wear your clothes at all tight, she observed. But <laughs> mice have strange ideas of comfort. I had to get rid of it while you were asleep, he continued. Then, with a gulp, he added, it, it was getting rid of it that brought me to, to this. Surely leaving off one small mouse wouldn't bring on a chill, she exclaimed, with a levity that Theodoric accounted abominable. Evidently, she had detected something of his predicament and was enjoying his confusion. All the blood in his body seemed to have mobilized in one concentrated blush, and an agony of abasement worse than a myriad mice crept up and down over his soul. And then, as reflection began to assert itself, sheer terror took the place of humiliation. With every minute that passed, the train was rushing nearer to the crowded and bustling terminus where dozens of prying eyes would be exchanged for the one paralyzing pair that watched over him from the further corner of the carriage. There was one slender, despairing chance which the next few minutes must decide. His fellow traveler might relapse into a, a blessed slumber but as the minutes throbbed by, that chance ebbed away. The furtive glance which Theodoric stole at her from time to time disclosed only an unwinking wakefulness. I think we must be getting near now, she presently observed. Theodoric had already noted with growing terror the recurring stacks of small, ugly buildings that heralded the journey's end. The words acted as a signal, like a, a hunted beast breaking cover and dashing madly towards some other haven of momentary safety. He threw aside his rug and struggled frantically into his disheveled garments. He was conscious of dull suburban stations racing past the window of a, a choking, hammering sensation in his throat and heart and, and of an icy silence, silence in that corner towards which he dared not look. Then, as he sank back into his seat, clothed and almost delirious, the train slowed down to a final crawl and the woman spoke. Would you be so kind, she asked, as to get me a porter to put me into a cab? Well, it's a shame to trouble you when you're feeling unwell, but being blind makes one so helpless in a railway station. is coming in to tea, said Mrs. Hoopington to her niece. He's just gone round the stables with his horse. Be as bright and lively as you can. The poor man's got a fit of the glooms. Major Pallaby was a victim of circumstances over which he had no control, and of his temper over which he had very little. He had taken on the mastership of the Pexdale Hounds in succession to a highly popular man who had fallen afoul of his committee, and the Major found himself confronted with the overt hostility of at least half the hunt, 
while his lack of tact and amiability had done much to alienate the remainder. Hence, subscriptions were beginning to fall off, foxes grew provokingly scarcer, and wire obtruded itself with increasing frequency. The Major could plead reasonable excuse for his fit of the glooms. In ranging herself as a partisan on the side of Major Pallenby, Mrs. Hoopington had been largely influenced by the fact that she had made up her mind to marry him at an early date. Against his notorious bad temper, she had set his three thousand a year, and his prospective succession to a baronetcy gave a casting vote in his favour. The Major's plans on the subject of matrimony were not at present at such a, an advanced stage as Mrs. Hoopington's, but he was beginning to find his way over to Hoopington Hall with a, a frequency that was already being commented on. He had a wretchedly thin field out again yesterday, said Mrs. Hoopington. Why you didn't bring one of or two hunting men down with you instead of that stupid Russian boy, I, I can't think. Vladimir isn't stupid, protested her niece. He's, he's one of the most amusing boys I've ever met. Just compare him for a moment with some of your heavy hunting men. Well, anyhow, my dear Nora, he can't ride. Well, Russians never can, but he shoots. Yes, <laughs> and what did he shoot? Yesterday he brought home a woodpecker in his game bag. But he'd shot three pheasants and, and some rabbits as well. well. That's no excuse for including a woodpecker in his game bag. Well, foreigners go in for mixed bags more than we do. A, a Grand Duke pops a vulture just as, as seriously as we should stalk a bustard. Anyhow, I've, I've explained to Vladimir that Certain birds are beneath his dignity as a sportsman, and as he's only nineteen, of course, he's, his dignity is a sure thing to appeal to. Mrs. Hoopington sniffed. Most people with whom Vladimir came in contact found his high spirits infectious, <laughs> but his present hostess was guaranteed immune against infection of that sort. I hear him coming in now, she observed. I shall go and get ready for tea. We're going to have it here in the hall. Entertain the Major if he comes in before I'm down at the bubble. Be bright. Nora was dependent on her aunt's good graces for many little things that made life worth living, and she was conscious of a feeling of discomfiture because the Russian youth whom she had brought down as a, a welcome element of change in the country house routine was not making a good impression. That young gentleman, however, was supremely unconscious of any shortcomings and burst into the hall, tired and less sprucely groomed than usual, but distinctly radiant. His game bag looked comfortably full. Guess what I have shot, he demanded. Pheasants, wood pigeons, rabbits, hazarded Nora. No, no, a large beast. I don't know what you call it in English, but brown with, with a darkish tail. Nora changed colour. Does it live in a tree and eat nuts? she asked, hoping that the use of the adjective large might be an exaggeration. Vladimir laughed. No, no, not the Bielka. Does it swim and eat fish? asked Nora with a, a fervent prayer in her heart that it might turn out to be an otter. No, said Vladimir, busy with the st straps of his game bag. It lives in the woods and eats rabbits and chickens. Nora sat down suddenly and hid her face in her hands. Merciful heaven, she wailed. He shot a fox! Vladimir looked up at her in consternation, in, in, in a tone.
torrent of, of agitated words, she tried to explain the horror of the situation. The boy understood nothing but, but was thoroughly alarmed. Hide it! Hide it! said Nora frantically, pointing to the still unopened bag. My my aunt and, and the major will be here in a minute. The, throw it on top of that chest. They won't see it there. Vladimir swung the bag with fair aim, but the strap caught in its flight on, on the outstanding point of an antler fixed in the wall, and the bag, with its terrible burden, remained suspended just above the alcove where tea would presently be laid. At that moment, Mrs. Hoopington and the Major entered the hall. The Major is going to draw our covers tomorrow, announced the lady with a certain heavy satisfaction. Smithers is confident that we'll be able to show him some sport. He swears he's seen a fox in, in the nut copse three times this week. Well, I'm sure I hope so. I hope so, said the Major moodily. I must break this sequence of blank days. One hears so often that a, a fox has settled down as a tenant for life in certain covers, and then, then when you go to, to turn him out, there isn't a trace of him. I'm certain a fox was shot or trapped in Lady Widden's woods the very day before we drew them. Major, if anyone tried that game on in my woods, they'd get short shrift, said Mrs. Hoopington. Nora found her way mechanically to the tea table and made her fingers frantically busy in rearranging the parsley round the sandwich dish. On one side of her loomed the morose countenance of the Major, and on the other she was conscious of the scared, miserable eyes of Vladimir. And above it all hung that. She dared not raise her eyes, above the level of the tea table, and, and she almost expected to see a spot of accusing vulpine blood drip down and stain the whiteness of the cloth. Her aunt's manner signalled to her the repeated message to be bright. <laughs> For the present she was fully occupied in keeping her teeth from chattering. What did you shoot today? asked Mrs. Hoopington suddenly of the unusually silent Vladimir. Nothing, nothing for speaking of, said the boy. Nora's heart, which had stood still for a space, made up for lost time with a most disturbing bound. Well, I wish you'd find something that was worth speaking about, said the hostess. Everyone seems to have lost their tongues. When did Smithers last see that fox? said the Major. Yesterday morning, a fine dog fox with a dark brush, confided Mrs. Hoopington. Uh -huh. <laughs> we'll have a good gallop after that brush tomorrow, said the Major, with a, a transient gleam of good humour. And then gloomy silence settled again round the tea table, a silence broken only by the despondent munchings and occasional feverish rattle the teaspoon in its saucer. A diversion was at last afforded by Mrs. Hoopington's fox terrier, which had jumped onto a vacant chair the, the better to survey the delicacies of the table, and was now sniffing in an upward direction at something apparently more interesting than cold tea cake. What is exciting him? asked his mistress, as the dog suddenly broke into short, angry barks with a, a running accompaniment of tremulous whines. Why, she continued, it's your game bag, Vladimir. What have you got in it? By gad, said the Major, who was now standing up, there's a pretty warm scent. And then... A simultaneous idea flashed on himself and Mrs. Hoopington. Their faces flushed 
to distinct but harmonious tones of purple, and with one accusing voice they screamed, You've shot the fox! Nora tried hastily to palliate Vladimir's misdeed in their eyes, but it is doubtful whether they heard her. The Major's fury clothed and reclothed itself in, in words as, as frantically as a woman up in town for one day shopping tries on a succession of garments. He reviled and railed at fate and the, the general scheme of things. He pitied himself with a strong, deep pity too poignant for tears. He condemned everyone with whom he had ever come in contact to endless and abnormal punishments. In fact, he conveyed the impression that if his destroying angel had been lent to him for a week, it would have had very little time for private study. In the lulls of his outcry could be heard the querulous monotone of Mrs. Hoopington and the sharp staccato barking of the fox terrier. Vladimir, who did not understand a tithe of what was being said, sat fondling a cigarette and repeating under his breath from time to time a, a vigorous English adjective, which he had long ago taken affectionately into his vocabulary. His mind strayed back to the youth in the old Russian folktale who had shot an enchanted bird with dramatic results. Meanwhile, the Major, roaming round the hall like, like an imprisoned cyclone, had caught sight of and joyfully pounced on the telephone apparatus and lost no time in ringing up the hunt secretary and announcing his resignation of the mastership. A servant had by this time brought his horse round to the door, and in a few seconds Mrs. Hoopington's shrill monotone had the feel to itself. But after the Major's display, her best efforts at vocal violence missed their full effect. It was as though one had come straight out from a Wagner opera into a rather tame thunderstorm. Realising, perhaps, that her tirades were something of an anticlimax, Mrs. Hoopington broke suddenly into some rather necessary tears and marched out of the room leaving behind her a silence almost as terrible as the turmoil which had preceded it. What shall, what shall he do with that? asked Vladimir at last. Bury it, said Nora. Just plain burial? asked Vladimir, rather relieved. He had he had almost expected that some of the local clergy might have insisted on being present, or, or that a salute might have to be fired over the grave. And thus it came to pass that, in the dusk of a November evening, the Russian boy, murmuring a few of the prayers of his church for luck, gave hasty but decent burial to a large Pole cat under the lilac trees at Hoopington.